Well, welcome everybody to another one of Hydra Terra's webinars. Today we're joined back by Phil Mulvey, who's going to talk to us all about managing water use efficiency on farms by managing the small water cycle. Phil joins a very elite bunch of repeat presenters on our webinar series, so well done, Phil. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. I also pay my respects to their elders, past and present. So Phil's here today representing Rhizo Australia, which was formerly known as Carbon Count. He also is CEO of Environmental and Earth Sciences. I'll just give you a little bit of background about Phil. Phil is part consultant, part contractor, part researcher, and part entrepreneur, but has always been a free thinker. He has built army bases in East Timor, supervised the erection of the largest tent in the United Kingdom, sold meat pies in the USA, cleaned up two uranium mines, developed townhouses on landfills, rewrote the manual on oil palm development on potential acid sulfate soil in Sumatra, evaluated rehabilitation of the desert in Kuwait, participated in the first green city design in the world, evaluated degraded land on the Monaro, and he has represented Australia in sailing. He currently has businesses in environmental soil science, whole of farm management, remediation, and civil earthworks and property development, in which he has trained numerous scientists in the art of commercial scientific problem solving. He is a father of four and a grandfather soon to be of eight. Well, I think he might actually have eight now. His, um, <laughs> I'll skip over that next bit. He's proud to say he is a soil scientist in landscape repair. He remains passionate about the subject and value of our profession, particularly with regard to our role in landscape repair. I would say that uh, we're very lucky to have Phil here today. He is one of the unique thinkers around landscape repair and uh, the detail is around an understanding of soil science and how that relates to the hydrology that we are looking at today is something that very few people actually do have knowledge of in certainly in Australia. So it's fantastic to have Phil here today to present on this topic. Before we charge in and let Phil get going, the, we love your questions and thank you very much to all those early bird questions. We've got heaps of early bird questions for this webinar, but uh, love to have more questions as we go and you use the Q&A button at the top of your screen to lodge those questions. Why does Hydroterra undertake these webinars? Well, it gives me a chance to catch up with friends like Phil but we really love to share our knowledge. We like to facilitate education and we like to take an industry leadership position. So there's something that Hydroterra is very proud of. Without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Phil and start his presentation. Thank you, Richard. Um was a very flattering uh, introduction. I do appreciate it. Uh, I also would like to um, thank all elders, uh, past and present, who nurture and care for land wherever they may be. Um, managing the water use efficiency on farms by managing the small water cycle has been somewhat of a passion of mine <clears throat> for for many many years. Uh, next slide, please, Richard. Um, and it, it really focuses on holding water on landscape, which is what the talk's going to be a bit about. So you can see see in that uh, talk just the, the front of that slide, just a faint mist hanging over the landscape. So we'll talk about why we've had quite a bit of it this season and why we really want to keep it. Next slide, please. My background is a Bachelor of Science in 
for culture. I have a master's in hydrogeology and environmental geology and had the pleasure of working with Richard for a period of time whilst he was doing his master's on hydrogeology. Um, I've been in consulting on land repair for my entire career in excess of 40 years. And more recently, I published a book with my daughter um, on ground, uh, called Groundbreaking Soil Security and Climate Change, which is being re-released the second edition in September. Next slide, please, Richard. Most people think about climate change as you know rise of temperature. But in actual fact, you can plot climate change starting a lot earlier. Um, and it's the frequency of extreme heat events that, that is most outstanding. This is a direct extract from State of the Climate, um, which is done every two years by the Bureau of Meteorology. So this was the 2020 release. But you can see the impact there. Most of that heat rise is actually due to the loss of small water cycle and how we have managed the landscape to cause that. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is that the climate change I'm concerned about is what's coming from landscape. Next slide, please. It's interesting that um, the impacts of climate change in Australia were first identified by the explorer Paul Spreslecki in 1845. And he wrote very clearly that climate change in Australia was being caused by loss of organic matter and soil and vegetative cover. And the loss of the frequent rains that occurred in Sydney um, had dissipated with some of the seasons beyond just the standard drought cycle that Australia was aware of even at that time. He was 50 years ahead of Aunt Henus, who actually discovered and wrote about the greenhouse effect. Next slide, please. So there are actually two slides, two aspects to the, the climate debate. One is the heat and one is the blanket. And when uh, Dr. Keeling, the guy who measured CO2 from Hawaii for over 50 years, was asked by President Carter back in 1978, you know, what should government do about climate change? Keeling replied, it's way too complicated for people to understand. So just focus on greenhouse gas emissions. And that's where we've been ever since. So brief little bit of science, sensible and latent heat. Next slide, please. So this is important, particularly for the small water cycle. When you've got a situation where the incoming solar energy, what gets past the clouds, 95% of it goes to one of two heats, one being latent heat and one being sensible heat. Latent heat is change of uh, state. So it's moving from solid to liquid or liquid to gas. So when you boil water, it never changes over 100 degrees C until the water changes. Even if you put huge amounts of energy in, whilst the water's there, it's controlling the temperature to 100 degrees C. That's latent heat. Surprising enough, it's also to do with the melting of bitumen, which I'll come back to that one later. The other heat is sensible heat. So when you heat a surface, so all the water's gone and you continue to heat the saucepan, and it's a, a metal source, say an iron saucepan, at 550 degrees C, so it rises up to that temperature, it produces, it goes red hot. That red it's releasing is infrared. So you heat the earth during the day and it releases infrared in the evening or late afternoon and evening, which bounces off the clouds and comes back. So everyone's been talking about, well, it's, we've thickened up the blanket, but have we also changed the amount of heat that the land is producing? i.e. change the heat source. Next slide, please. Well, we have. So here's an example, published example from uh, Slovenia, where you see that um, a wet pasture meadow, which is a type of um, summer pasture that's used in production systems in Southern Europe, has 70 to 80 percent latent heat evapotranspiration and 5 to 10 percent sensible heat for the incoming solar radiation conversion. The same land, same slope, a couple of kilometres away, had been cleared for um, agriculture uh, cropping and tilled. So this is not a no-till system. This is a tilled system. And you've actually got 60 to 70 percent sensible heat, and only 10 to 20 percent evaporation. So what you're doing there now is you're effectively putting somewhere between um, six and 10 times increase of the energy being created from sensible heat. 
no one's looking at this. Next slide, please. So what does that do to the day? Well, what it does to the day, as you can see there, is it gets much hotter during the day, which has a big impact on what, what happens to the small water cycle. So you, you get much hotter during the day because of all that baked heat, that infrared being released up. Next slide, please. So that's Europe. Let's look at Australia. So there was an exercise undertaken in um, down in Adelaide on the science show where they just used a temperature gun and aimed it at different things and gave it to the public to go out on a 35 degree day. They, they gave, I think, 10 or 12 to schools and the schools went out and shot at various things. So there was 35 degree C day. The bare ground was 50 to 60. The artificial grass was 50 to 60. Don't have your kids playing on artificial grass during a hot day. Natural grass was 25. That was pretty good. Bitumen was 35 to 40. Bitumen melts at about 35. So the melting of the bitumen actually meant that the temperature didn't get as high as the bare ground. Next slide. So that's it for theory, almost. Um, one tree in terms of evapotranspiration is equivalent to 10 air conditioning units, room air conditioning units. And that's just worth bearing in mind. Next slide, please. So the small water cycle, how does it fit into all this? Everyone knows the large water cycle. We got taught it in primary school or maybe years, seven or eight geography, where uh, the oceans evaporated by solar energy, clouds form, they go onto land, they rise up, um, as it goes onto the land, a mountain range or whatever, the, uh, the change in temperature with the moisture content forms rain, the rain falls onto the hills, which flows down and might go through a dam, might go into, or does go portion of groundwater, but then all comes back into the ocean. That's the large water cycle. Next slide, please. The small water cycle is somewhat different. It has a series of events where evapotranspiration, so you can see there's evaporation, results in uh, local precipitation events. So the water that is, is evapor evapotranspired locally falls in the local area as light winter rains, mists, and summer thunderstorms. Next slide, please. So, I've got my, my piece across my image here. Um, that, um, so the small water cycle is actually responsible for 40 to 7% of the local rain. And in equatorial regions, so if you take the Amazon and the Congo, only 5% of the water is in the Amazon River and leaves um, the area. So only 5% is actually of the rain that falls in the region comes from the ocean. 95% is the small water cycle. And the small water cycle perpetuates the water inland, 2,500 kilometers. So we'll come back to that shortly. It's, the small water cycle is responsible for the dew, the fog, the mist, the soft rain during winter, and the summer thunderstorms. It magnifies the impact of the water cycle, the large water cycle. So you certainly need the large water cycle to keep the small water cycle running. This is a shot taken in Mittigong straight after the drought. As you can see, the buildup of a summer thunderstorm at Mittigong, where you've got um, a lot of, uh, or you've got the Blue Mountains National Park, and that's where the thunderstorms um, start from and then move across into Sydney. Next slide, please. This is winter rain at Orange back in 2020. So you can see it's a very light uh, winter rain that's falling. Next slide, please. This is an example of the impact of um, vegetation on the left. So you've got pastoral land on the left and on the right, you've got cropping. And this is actually the rabbit proof fence in Southwest Western Australia. You can see the clouds are directly forming within a kilometer or so of the fence um, over um, the higher evapotranspirate um, lands. Um, so this represents both summer uh, autumn and early winter, surprising enough because of um, the growth during spring, you actually get the clouds forming the other side of the fence during spring, which I suppose is, is somewhat obvious if you're dealing with the vapid transpiration. Next slide, please. 
When you look at the steady state associated with a small water cycle, that occurs when the evaporation rate is actually less than the water stored in the landscape. So that's in a tropical environment that doesn't have a great seasonality. It's also in environments where um, you can get a long way from the coast and have trees uh, uh, evapotranspirating so much water that it's even throughout at the whole year. So those trees roll water inland and that's known as the biotic pump, which was um, only discovered in 2007 when some um, uh, climate modelers looked at the distance that water's carried inland uh, from the coast and realized it's only about 800 kilometers and that the small water cycle perpetuates water inland beyond that. Um, and this mostly occurs this steady state situation, Amazon and Congo around the tropics. Um, next slide, please. So you can see it here that you've got trees going all the way inland, 2000 kilometers. On the bottom, you've got evaporation infiltration. On the top, you've got total precipitation and you've got the cycles of the small water cycle just carrying it all the way in, uh, inland due to the presence of um, massive soaking of the land with both organic matter and uh, vegetative cover of the soil. Next slide, please. So non-steady state, sorry, steady state non-saturated occurs in a situation you've got mountain ranges or you've got distinct seasonality, but the dry season is so long that the evaporation exceeds precipitation, which is what occurs in temperate and semi-temperate, um, semi-arid monsoon and monsoonal environments. In this instance, the small water cycle is about 20 to 60, uh, sorry, um, roughly uh, 20 to 40 percent. Um, with the, the rest being replaced from the sea. Um, it can be as high as 60%. Next slide, please. So in this instance, you can see that as you move inland, um, the evaporation infiltration uh, diminishes with distance and doesn't provide enough to keep the um, rainfall e equivalent to what's occurring on the coast. So you're seeing that as you go inland, the small water cycle diminishes. But you also see extreme events starting to occur where you see the amplification of global climate um, uh, forcing factors such as um, the different oceans, the temperature of the different oceans, which in the Pacific Oceans is called the El Nino-La Nina effect. And they result in extreme events happening when the small water cycle may dry up during a period associated with the drought. Next slide, please. So now we look at the non-steady state, and this is when man's involved in it, and the seasonality becomes extreme and unreliable because the vegetation is mostly eliminated, and the soil organic matter is reduced. So you end up with a lot more extreme wet, uh, so a lot more extreme wet and um, dry seasons. So drought and flooding. Next slide, please. So this looks like, well, as you can see on the pictorial above. You've got mostly agricultural land. You've got a rapid dim diminution of evaporation and infiltration of water in the landscape as you move inland. Um, and so at the same time, you've got the total precipitation um, also diminishing and extreme events increasing substantively and the small water cycle reducing substantively as you move inland. Next slide, please. So what you see is as we move to that last one, the non-steady state, an increase in extreme events associated by the loss of the small water cycle. Next slide, please. This is just to make sure that your vision's working well. For some reason, that's come across and been shrunk. Um, so the loss of the small water cycle increases heat, it reduces rain, um, and it also reduces reliable rain, and massively increases runoff. And we'll explain that in more detail shortly. It increases extreme events, both floods as we've seen recently and heat waves. It increases the severity of bushfires, it depopulates rural regions and it ushers in desertification. It's actually a very significant thing at continental uh, level to lose this small water cycle. Next slide, please. So across Australia, it's been measured clear cut um, in the, the winter rains, so that's the southern part of Australia, roughly Dubbo South. Um, has reduced rainfall by 20 to 30% due to this small water cycle loss. 
except in the years which is current following the La Nina, when the biotic pump after the first rainfall event is reinstated. So at the moment, we have a biotic pump that's reinstated um, across Australia. And so you would have seen, and I just I drove back yesterday from Cootamundra, um, that there is now morning fogs and they're way more extensive than they have been for previous years. So we're going to see, uh, even if the La Nina returns, the impact of destroying the body pump will take a few years. So it will be a little while before drought returns, so we will go through some dry seasons. But what's really interesting, and this is where um, some very interesting scientific data has come up recently that Richard would find interesting, is that we're now using a term called a hydraulic drought, that after the drought and rains has returned, we're finding that the river flow has not returned. Next slide, please. So there was a study done in Victoria, and I'm sorry about the image of this, um, published in the Science Journal. The Science Journal is the leading journal in the world. They reject somewhere between, um, well, they take between, somewhere between one and 500 and 1,000 papers submitted. So this is talking about looking at the recovery of, of river catchments after the millennial drought between sort of 2002 to 2010, depending where you were. And that millennial drought had a massive impact. Um, and then the 10 years or before the most recent drought, so the eight or nine years following, the river catchments um, recovered, but a number didn't. And they looked at a two-state model to look at the recovery and to see how bad the recovery was. And you can see the red areas uh, considered where, the where they've literally, in some instances, almost not recovered at all. And those red areas correspond with the gold mining areas. So for those who are familiar with it, it's Bendigo, Ballarat, Castle, Castle Main, um, and you're getting, as you're moving a little bit further west, to Ararat and Stall. So you're seeing effectively a type of soil that the hydrogeologist or the hydrologist here weren't aware of, is you're dealing with a massive soil that's quite dispersive. And so when you lose the organic matter, the infiltration goes up, because it goes down a lot, the runoff goes up a lot, so that means you get peak floods, but you get almost no basal flow because the groundwater um, that recharges during the winter is now actually below the level of the bed of the, of the creek or river. So you've seen a massive change in landscape associated to soil use and soil type. Next slide, please. So that leads into how our floods impacted. Um, Yagawi, um, recorded a sudden and big flood. Interesting enough, though the rainfalls were in the um, third to 10th highest rainfalls we're getting in, in, the, in the last um, 12 months, they produced these flood events. The flood peaks were close to the maximum we've ever recorded and, and Ugawi was the maximum by far. So what you're actually seeing is a degraded landscape produces a very intense short burst flood um, but doesn't have good basal flow. So it tends to be short and sharp and then drop away, but doesn't have that uh, flow that occurs throughout the winter. So you're dealing with a comparison there with a, with a hydrated landscape with elevated soil organic matter um, and saturated alluvium has entirely different response to the degraded landscape. Next slide, please. Um, this, this is the Solomon Islands. Um, I was there in February. I've been going every two years to this same spot to do diving for the last 20 years. Um, in 2019, there was no evidence of sea level rise. This, this is a three to 400 millimetre sea level rise flooding the island. Next slide, please. And uh, even Levy Brothers aren't stupid enough to try and grow palm trees in plantations out in the ocean. So here you can see the impact on the palm trees of the plantation. Interesting enough, um, most people don't realise that the, the at least 50% of the elevation and sea level rise is not associated with melting with icebergs or um, thermal expansion due to rising temperature of water is actually due to increased runoff of rivers as a result of pumping of groundwater for agriculture and the fact that we now have a circumstance of increased 
runoff um, leading to greater flood events. So we've just had um, two, almost three East Coast lows with massive runoffs from Australia. So this is not to do with the thermal expansion. This is actually to do with the pulse of increased runoff from Australia moving across the Pacific. Next slide, please. So the thing to understand about um, hydraulic systems associated is that within Australia on a hilly landscape, you actually get the control of groundwaters, the shallow groundwater is topographically controlled, so it flows towards the rivers. But there's not much alluvium in the, in the rivers, so you get a pretty sharp def uh, definition between um, uh, fast or oh, well, flowing during the winter and completely dry during the summer. So that's ephemeral systems in, in steep hilly landscapes. Next slide, please. This is a system that's not being eroded or degraded or developed by man. Um, so you're dealing with a circumstance where you've got a drought where it's below um, the river base, a normal dry season where it's right at the river base, um, a normal wet season where it's above the river base. So the difference between those two, the wet season, the dry season, means that the groundwater is recharging uh, the river, hence the basal flow. The major recharge also occurs during the flood when the alluvium is fully recharged. Note that the some roots go down beyond the alluvium into the weathered rock um, because that becomes important for um, survival of tree species during the drought. So they're down tapping the deep water. That, uh, that's a, I haven't a changed, that E is supposed to be a P, a Greek P, so it hasn't come out all that well. So that's just talking about porosity. So the fresh rock porosity is less than 0.01. The weathered rock is less than 0.05 and the alluvium porosity is 0.3. So that means that 30% of the pore space in alluvium could be filled by air or water. And in weathered rock, it's less than 5% and fresh rock, it's less than 1%. So you really want to have a lot of alluvium if you want to have a lot of water available for you. Next slide, please. On a degraded landscape, what happens is that um, you get severe uh, erosion um, due to the way we've managed our landscapes and how we've managed our river systems. So the river beds itself down somewhere between the weathered rock and the fresh rock. So you've now got a system that it's, the only thing that charges the alluvium is a, is a full on flood. The normal wet season never actually gets into the alluvium because it's sit in the weathered rock. And the dry wet season sitting at the base of the creek has only got very little recharge available to it. Um, and then you see the drought, which has got nothing. So the amount of water available for basal flow is now very minimal. Next slide, please. So when you get a, a, a drought, that, a flood that comes through, it does recharge some alluvium, but you can see if the amount of air it's recharging is very small. So the basal flow then will rapidly depend on the weathered rock at less than 5% porosity compared to the alum at 30%. So firstly, you've got a six times difference. And secondly, you've got a much smaller aerial coverage that the water's recharging. So that means the basal flow is severely impeded by the fact that you haven't saturated your alluvium. So you end up with these short, sharp floods with no basal flow and not much alluvium recharge during the, the flood event. Next slide. And oh, sorry, just on that slide, notice you've got 95% runoff and only 5% infiltration because the top part of that soil has been compacted by agricultural activities, by sheep, by vehicles. Um, so you end up with a circumstance where you've got a high runoff um, and a low infiltration. There's not much roughage on that surface too, as well, because it becomes self-compacting and massive. Um, so gr graphically, you can see the difference between those two arrows, the small arrow going in, 5%, the arrow running across the top of the surface runoff, 95%. Next slide, please. So this is um, when it, what uh, Richard will talk about a little bit later in, re in regards to the Learn Institute. So, so this is, um, utilizing 
um, some of Peter Andrews' theories, but also it, it goes back earlier to um, uh, Yeoman, um, where you look to encourage um, water to uh, infiltrate in the landscape more. And in this instance, by a series of weirs um, and recovering some of the, the alluvium, you've got recent alluvium starting to fill in the erosion, and you've got the paleo alluvium now can be reflooded. So now you're looking at the circumstance where you're trying to create a situation with only 5% runoff and 95% infiltration. Notice the trees have been replanted at the zones of springs. So if the water table rises high at that change of slope, it will create a spring, which is happening right throughout the, um, the southern um, slopes at the moment, where there's a lot of uh, springs occurring, a lot, a lot of pugged and boggy ground. So we do have to ensure that those that there is um, mechanisms to address as there was back um, prior to clearing of those springs. So you can see that um, the combination of trees at the right landscape and the uh, use of, um, of weirs and, and where to place your leaky weirs and where to, where to place your, wet, your wetlands and recovered wetlands increases the water in your landscape as well as the evapotranspiration. Next slide, please. So what we're trying to do now is move to the green line away from the orange line that we have been on. Next slide, please. So what causes the loss of the small water cycle? Upfront loss of soil organic matter, then loss of vegetative cover is what causes um, the water tables to drop and the erosion to appear. Increased sulfate dust and sulfate dust stops um, water uh, droplets forming to bigger droplets so they can fall as rain. It also results in keeping the boundary layer, that is the cloud layer, up much higher. Uh, we've lost in many landscapes vertical turbulence, so we don't have enough trees in the landscape, our landscape's flat, so we don't create turbulence in air, and so we don't create op the opportunity for clouds to form. And we're also increasing willy-willies by giving too long a vertical run and the strength of those willy willies is now starting to draw, to destroy trees and houses and move towards tornadoes. So we've lost the roughness in our landscape and we're failing to hold water at source. Our alluvium's not flooded, our creeks are incised. Um, the top two are uh, in relation to the loss of soil security of the landscape. And I'll just briefly cover those. Next slide, please. It's interesting to look at where does this occur in the world. This is just a straight um, run from um, David Montgomery, um, a soil scientist who's written a number of books on degradation. So you can see here the amount of land impacted by agriculture as you move from 1700, 1800, 1900 to 2000. So you can see that we are substantively changing across the world the source of the heat as well as the blanket. Next slide, please. So this is um, a tillage landscape. You can see the willy willies in the background. This is in Griffith in 2019. Next slide, please. And this is grazed country. Um, many people consider this, you know, reasonable coverage, but you can see this is about 70% bare ground. It's, it's highly compacted, doesn't have much roughage on it. The uh, rain won't infiltrate. It will run off quite quickly. Next slide, please. So are we able to fix, and we are, and here's some of the things that are resulted with fixing it. So we do have to keep ground covered. Oh, I'd go 100% cover 100% of the time. Let's start with 90%. We have to avoid monoculture and we need to build organic matter. We have to hold water at source, which is, you know, we flood the alluvium and, and look at inflow on the slopes. And we have to have eco corridors to increase air turbulence to bring more rain. We have to move from yield to profit as a measure for farmers rather than just focusing on what their agricultural yield is. And we should be using um, systems measure of success to define our success, which is uh, things like um, increased children at the local public school, uh, reduced suicide rates. We need sophisticated rotation systems of pest and weed management, nutrient supply, um, and the other is a particular agricultural problem, which is address the phosphate um, issue. Next slide, please. 
So what is efficiency? What is efficiency in land is directly related to managing carbon. So we started these trials um, and a colleague of mine, uh, uh, um, Peter McInerney, started them um, in 2005, 2007, when the focus then was, was on water use efficiency, not directly on carbon. But what we did do is, is set about to increase carbon um, in, the, in the soil by a rotational system. Ardlethan at that point in time was not considered a permanent cropping zone, but opportunistically cropped cropping. So you can see that um, by increasing the water use efficiency on that first column is not to five years, the second column's uh, five to 10 and the third column is 10 to 15. So over about a 12 year period, we were able to increase the water use efficiency from 65 to 95% and it, by increasing the carbon. The um, crop inputs did greatly go down because we did have to increase nitrogen to actually increase the carbon that was stored, but we were fairly careful about how we handle that nitrogen increase. So you can see the profitability has just gone up hugely at the same time as the farm income in green at the top's gone up as well. Next slide, please. Once you get to the more wetter areas at 600 mils, such as Colcane, uh, it, it wasn't so um, uh, such a radical increase, but we did get the increase as we improved the water use efficiency from 65% to 95% over that time period. We also lifted um, the return to the farmers significantly, but, but not by the same amount. So water use efficiency has a lot to do with improved profitability of farm and water use efficiency is direct, directly related to the amount of carbon you've got in your soil. Next slide, please. So that's why we're excited about soil carbon. Next slide. Um, the primary reason is some interesting differences between uh, Google Slides and PowerPoint coming out here, my apologies. So the, the primary reason is associated that we increase soil carbon to increase water use efficiency, which increases profit. But the secondary reason is to consider carbon as a long-term crop. Next slide. Um, and carbon as a long-term crop increases the plant available water. That's to say that's the water between the permanent wilting point and field capacity. It doesn't actually increase the water content in the soil overall. It actually increases what's available and what a plant can get to, as opposed to the total water. It also increases the infiltration rate significantly, which is what you've, we've just discussed earlier in regard to the issues associated with floods. And it increases roughage uh, across the land and resistance to pugging. So when you get a, um, the center of the, those rainfall events are very heavy, and when you get um, a, um, really a heavy rate of rainfall, it exceeds the infiltration rate of what the soil can cope with. So if you get 10 or 20 minutes of heavy rainfall and you end up with runoff, but if the runoff is held by some roughage and things that cause puddles, then the soil's got a chance to catch up. So by having some roughage across your land, you increase the infiltration associated with it. You can put roughage in, and that's the concept behind the yeoman's plow system, or you can do it um, through your nature of your agriculture. Uh, next slide, please. So there's the, the benefits of, of having increased carbon on terms of um, your water use and its infiltration. But some of the other benefits are less hot spills and surprising enough, um, uh, less frost by having more carbon in your system. Next slide, please. Uh, we've covered this in a previous presentation, but I'm just going to do the first two slides of this, but I'll make sure the, PD, the rest of the slides are available for those who want to revisit it later in the, in the, uh, the, P, the PDF of the slides. I'm, I think Richard does that, and, but certainly the recording. So soil carbon is made up of dead living matter and it's breakdown products, and it exists of several overlapping time-dependent pools. So just briefly, next slide. These three pools have a huge impact on what happens uh, with time in agriculture. Um, so you've got the labile pool, the um, intermediate or semi-permanent pool, and the intractable pool. And mineralization is the breakdown of the carbon rapidly by microbes, particularly bacteria, by the use of the plant. And humification is 
fungi and microbes working together to, to convert the dead matter to, to slightly longer term soil organic matter. So you want about 5% humification and about 90%, 95% mineralization for a, a successful um, soil system that lays down carbon. If you increase your humification, you move, you move to putrefaction, which is the process associated with boggy ground and, um, and swamps and, and peat and, and development of that environment. So there is a fine balance. Next slide, please. Store carbon mining is just briefly what we've done in the last 70 years. And it ends up with the three pools being not connected and quite separate. And everything that goes into the soils only lasts a very short period of time is converted back to CO2. Next slide, please. Soil carbon sequestration is a process by where, whereby you return that and start to overlap the pools, reduce the dominance of the labile pool. And as I just indicated, have about 5% humification. And to do that, you need to have fungi exceeding bacteria, where the other system bacteria exceed fungi. Um, down the bottom is the way to go about doing that, um, which is not dissimilar to what we talked about in restoring the small water cycle. Uh, next slide, please. To understand soil carbon sequestration, you need to look at what are the system constraints, the system controls, and the management controls. Next slide, please. So the system constraints are directly related to rainfall again, or irrigation, because the amount of water you've got for carbon se it, it decides the rate of carbon sequestration. It's the charge in the soil that decides the maximum. I've assumed in that that the, the management the practices you're doing optimizes the rate um, or the available rate by the rain that's there. Next slide, please. Just before you do, just run that CEC comment again. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, thanks for picking me up on, on acronyms, Richard. So can I exchange capacities the charge in the soil? I did rush through the little bit, but if you want the labile carbon to stick instead of being washed away or eaten by bacteria, then it needs to stick to mineral matter. So the higher the charge in the mineral matter, the more it can stick. Um, and therefore, once you've got the labile carbon stuck to it, it then the labile carbon can then use divalent cations, calcium and magnesium, to pull in to the um, the soil organic matter, the, the, the material that's just breaking down, and to hold it onto the mineral matter as well. Um, and then you get um, a thing called glomalin, which, which is released by the fungi, which cements the whole lot together to, to form aggregates. And can those aggregates then bind more carbon to them? Do you move they, away well, from... well, what the aggregates, you get mini, mini aggregates, then you get macro aggregates and macro aggregates is what you, mini aggregates are less than a couple of mil, macro aggregates are in the range of 20 to 30 mil, and that creates um, macro pores that allows rapid infiltration. Or mesopause really, not, not really macro pores, but mesopause. Um, we, better, we better move on. <laughs> yep. Thanks for that. Um, system controls, um, as we're just talking about is how you can improve the system to improve effective rain. We've talked all through that. Um, how to increase CC is actually, you can increase CC by biochar. You can have pattern burning for the landscape, which is what the traditional owners used to do, where they would burn depending on the landscape. So up north, it was once to every three years. Down in Tasmania, it was once every 50 years but mostly through Western New South Wales, the desert region and Western Australia, it's on a cycle every five to eight years. That five to eight years actually corresponds with the breakdown of the char from the grass um, by the fungi. Um, but for a short period of time, the char gets charged by the fungi and becomes um, a charged surface, which can hold the labile and intermediate carbon to it. So once again, that assumes your management optimizes the rates. That's your systems control. Management controls, the next slide, please, Richard. So management controls is about the management practices you do to meet the systems, um, the, the system's optimization. So you've got to have the right pH. 
If you're going to sequester carbon, you need nitrogen and phosphate and sulfur. So you're going to have the right ratio available. And you can do that by legumes, um, but not legumes alone. You might have to top it up with manures. Um, there's various things you can do if you don't want to use um, industrial fertilizers, which are salts of acids. Um, fungi must exceed back bacteria. You must maximize mesoporosity and minimize macroporosity. And macroporosity is great big cracks that go down in the soil. Um, and if you're going to maximize infiltration, you need to avoid bare ground and compaction. So you can see the organic matter and um, water in landscape and holding water in landscape are intimately tied. And then organic matter and vegetation is intimately tied um, with the small water cycle. Next slide, please. This is C to N ratio. It's more applicable to agricultural systems. It's just saying to increase fungi, you need to get a C to N ratio greater than 30. And a lot of our grass monocultural systems don't do that. Next slide, please. This is a very interesting example on soil carbon um, from a very progressive farmer who's operating irrigation areas. Um, the farmer actually thought that top yellow area uh, would have the highest carbon. It's got irrigation that puts on 30% more water than the rainfall. Um, and it has a circumstance whereby he thought, it, because it's, it's, it's his most profitable irrigated system, that it, it would have the highest carbon. In actual fact, he's, he's mining carbon there. He's probably only got a few years left of that high productivity. And if you look across to the area to the right at, at the same level up north with the road running through it, you see another irrigation pivot that's got a lot of red. And it was interesting that the one on the left, the, the large high productive one, is high productive because it contains just two grasses, rye and clover. And rye and clover don't produce any coarse material for the fungi. The one on the right's got fescue in it, and it produces coarse material for the fungi. So you can see that the organic matter hasn't been depleted to the same degree. And the fescue was invasive, so it wasn't actually sown. So that's why it has that particular pattern. So the grasses do control the organic matter sequestration because they, they control the soil biome, which in this instance is stimulating the fungi. Next slide, please. This is an, another example of the small water cycle in, in its minute eye. This is actually a paddock. So you can see that gray bit at the top of the, the telegraph pole is actually uh, in, the, in the middle ground is a paddock that was recently cut three days earlier cut for cane and the trash dropped. To the trash, he added a accelerant for breakdown. Um, and so three days later in the morning, it's both hotter and moister than the surrounding land. And it's actually got a fog um, that sat over the land to about 1.5 metres. So quite interesting. There's a slight fog around the rest of the, the landscape, um, but that particular paddock had um, a very intense fog associated um, with the warmer, wetter soil as a result of, of his activity there. Next slide, please. So in summary, improving the water use on farm. Two things need to use the rain more efficiently, the water that's provided more efficiently, both in irrigation and rain, and you need to get more rain. Next slide, please. Yeah. So in summary, using water more efficiently, you hold water at source, you promote infiltration over runoff. Um, so you do that with organic matter. You promote roughage. You have 100% cover 100% of the time. So plant selection, rotation systems, one for the soil, i.e. by putting fescue in or, or other or C4 grasses or grasses that are, uh, have a lot of coarse dry matter, you're actually feeding the fungi, which helps feed your whole system. Um, cell grazing um, also results in a system of 100% cover 100% of the time, and it's improved uh, um, opportunity for carbon sequestration, which we didn't talk a lot about. Um, use plants to optimize deep microporosity and, uh, and mesoporosity and create the right soil uh, biome, C to N ratio. So plant selection, rotational system, one for the soil biome and soil grazing. So 
those do the same two activities you need to be achieved. Recharge the alluvium and flatten the stream basal flow and flood peaks. So you want leaky weirs, wetlands and erosion management, which we didn't greatly talk about. And the detail of the leaky weirs and wetlands I'll leave to Richard to talk about. And to create more rain and return the small water cycle, we need to increase the latent heat. So once again, 100% cover 100% of the time. Um, we also need to put in eco corridors or, or to create turbulence by using eco corridors across the landscape. Um, we need to reduce the sulfate dust. And once again, the same two things occur, 100% 100% of the time does that and, and stopping long wind runs, which is your eco corridors. Reduce long, long, longitudinal wind runs to stop willy willies and lower the boundary layer which is also achieved by creating turbulence, which holds the rain locally, and having a biotic pump to, to ensure that you get moisture back in the air and you get better use of the moisture coming in from the coast and keeps circulating it round. So that's a summary of a high level, um, uh, very quick um, appraisal of the theory associated um, with returning the small water cycle um, through um, farm management practices. All right. Well, thanks, Phil, very much. Very comprehensive. Um, I've been actively involved in this area for a long time, and I suppose one of the key challenges is actually measuring the effectiveness of land use changes that are trying to restore this hydrologic or the local hydrological cycle. Um, all I want to do today, because we've got lots of questions, is highlight that there is a fantastic project going on with the Maloon Institute where we are measuring all of these various indicators of that local hydrological cycle. And we are, it's, it's over some 2,000 hectares and they are putting lots of leaky weir structures and things in. And we've had some people like Luke Peel present on that in the past on our webinars. But the challenge is to measure the effectiveness of those structures. And that's a challenge that Hydroterra has taken on. And there's many parameters that need to be measured. You know, like Phil's mentioned infiltration and overland flow. It's not easy to measure overland flow. You think about the structures you need to put in place and uh, just the cost of, of doing that sort of thing. Vegetation cover, we can do that with uh, satellite imagery and that's getting very good uh, on this project. It's a partnership with a company called Cybo Labs and they can give all sorts of uh, indicators of pasture, biomass, even split between pasture and woody vegetation. Um, the microbiology and fungi side of things, that's hard to do. Um, it's There are things like metabologenetic or genics, I should say, and things like that. And on this site, we haven't really delved into that in detail, but it's certainly an area that requires more investigation. Recharge, we're putting a lot of effort into measuring that up in this site, and we're looking at soil moisture and groundwater dynamics. Stream flow characteristics, we've got uh, gauging stations and we're measuring or interpreting base flow and storm hydrographs. Stream storage, so, you know, sort of resetting the, I guess, discharge point of your local catchment by holding water back in the catchment is a very important um, boundary condition for how much water is stored in your catchment. So measuring stream water levels the amount of water actually stored behind these leaky weir structures, um, that side of things is important. The measure of plant available water is an incredibly important indicator. And just for everyone's knowledge, DPI in New South Wales actually produces forecasts of plant available water for the whole of the state. I was pretty impressed that they do that. They use a model to produce that, and that's based on climate change forecasts and that sort of thing. I think that's an incredibly important indicator for this side of things. Phil's other heading, you know, create more rain. Well, how do we prove we're getting more rain? Obviously, we can measure it directly, but also indirect things like the greenness comparative to other areas. 
of the vegetation and the vegetation cover itself that's being retained are some of those. The reason I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this is there's been about $4 million of federal funding that's gone into developing this site and we are producing some pretty good data sets. The next challenge for us all is to use those data sets to undertake modeling and also some just further data analytics to be able to extrapolate that data into interpreting the uh, effectiveness of these changes. And it's a big job, but we're, um, looking, uh, or Maloon Institute's looking uh, at a very collaborative way of using that sort of data into the future. So please feel free to send me an email uh, if you're interested in uh, getting involved in that collaboration. Richard, um, just on, just before you move on, if you just go back one point, um, I didn't put up a slide on um, rainfall size versus density graphs. Um, and they're a, a key indicator of the small water cycle themselves. And um, unfortunately, that's only measured by laser. It's quite expensive. But I, I look forward to I'm not too sure if you're measuring it, the raindrop size and raindrop intensity of storm events. No, not yet. OK. So we see this as a long term monitoring site, and it's actually a fantastic opportunity for Australia because it's got this accreditation as a demonstration site. So it's only one of five organisations globally to have been selected by the United Nations Solutions Network as a demonstrator of regenerative agricultural land management practices. So it is an opportunity for Australian research um, to get behind. Uh, and it's really important that we start to really just get more definitive proof, I guess, of what these uh, practices are. We're also being involved with DPI New South Wales doing a study on scaling up these works across the whole of New South Wales with, with a grant from that. So there's a lot happening in this space, but uh, we need to start collaborating as a, uh, as a nation to accelerate adoption of this sort of thing. Um, without further ado, we better go to, I'll just skip over that, it's the Maloon catchment. We better go to all those questions that have come in. Many thanks for these early bird questions. So Phil, are you ready for this? Um, do you have analysis of scientific data that helps prove up your theories regarding the small water cycle? Well, I think uh, we've just shown some, but uh, Phil, do you want to talk to that? It's not just my theories. I, I'm a, a spokesman of, of many people's um, theories and beliefs in the small water cycle. So, look, there's quite a bit being done in, in Europe, and I can um, direct um, the question, um, the person who posed the question, to have a look at um, work done by Mikhail um, K H A R V I C K. I can't pronounce his name, but he's done um, quite a bit of work um, on looking on the impacts of the small water cycle uh, in the farming area and throughout Europe. So there is um, quite a bit done, but if you look at the word data, data equals measurement and observation. So a lot of the observation um, done by farmers are often dismissed and there is a great, concept west of the Newell, where many farmers talk about um, square clouds, where a particular farmer operating extreme conservation practices or regenerative ag is known to get more thunderstorms than the neighbours and have a higher rainfall than those on adjoining properties as a result. So that observation um, is part of the scientific data set that, that is helped building this theory and the measurements that you're collecting is also part of it. There's also all the modeling done by the Russians uh, in regards to the biotic water pump um, in 2007 through um, that's been um, quite interesting as well. And then there's the seasonality effects um, uh, starting to appear in the climate data. And the really interesting stuff is when the channel country flooded 
um, back in the last big flood season of, I think it was 2010 and 2011, that there was a massive kick up in carbon taken out of the air, um, of which two thirds of it was taken for the entire world was actually deposited as plant matter in the channel country of Australia. So um, that impact um, of sequestration and the following year, couple of years results of, uh, worldwide is, is quite apparent um, when you look at um, some of that data collection that, that the large regional cycles and the small water cycle impacts and that the, the um, buildup of vegetation um, is quite significant. One could argue that the East Coast lows we've had that have been repeating are only stuck and repeating themselves because of the biotic pump, but um, we're not quite advanced enough to be able to work out, is that a seasonal, is that a push effect from uh, the Pacific Ocean or is that a pull effect from, from the land and the biotic pump of Australia? All right, Phil, we're going to limit the question response times to uh, one minute or we can <laughs> But uh, thanks for that comprehensive response. Um, also, just the CRC for catchment hydrology, um, which uh, still has records that can be accessed, had a whole lot of data about um, small water cycle, particularly associated with forested catchments. There's some really good data there too. Um, question number two, have you had any success using recycled organic products, compost, mulches, et cetera, to restore degraded, drought-affected lands? In regard to degraded land, definitely. Um, but, I mean, it's how, it's what got, got me in the field in the first place was um, fixing tailings dams and waste rock dumps using composted paper and cardboard and timber that came into the mine in the desert area. Um, Biosolids can't be used because of their PFAS, um, but composts and mulches and manures. Um, we often backload for certain farmers if they send their produce um, into the into the city. So there's a, a barley grower who sends his barley in for malt that we have given advice to, who backloads pig manure, which um, is composted on the property and then put out into the paddock. Um, and there's no doubt that it's had a huge impact, at reducing cost of sales and improved the salinity impacts on his farm. And but I and I would also argue he, he and his data is showing that it's not long enough that he is, is getting more thunderstorms as a result. Um, but that once again is um, just a single farmer. So that's that's my one minute, Richard. <laughs> otherwise good. i'll go on lots of other very examples. good philip very good um nick good question number three how do you generally work engage with farmers and landowners are there challenges with getting them to buy in well surprising enough there's a yes and no to that and it's not, not going to be done in one minute but i've just got back from kudamandra running a, a six-hour prac on how to do this in terms of just from a soil point, point of view, but we also obviously talked um, a lot about uh, flooding the alluvium as well. Um, the farmers are very keen to buy in. The problem is there's a lack of examples nearby and the cost to buy in um, means you've got to change practice and the change of practice results in some expenditure, but may result in a loss of income in the first two years of change. That's called the valley of death. And so farmers actually want good um, examples in their region before they're keen to swap over, or they've got to have a very strong reason to swap over, or they have off farm in income. Um, and then the second limitation is there's very few farm advisors who have experience in how to do this, and that's, that's limiting. It's interesting to see the impact of, say, the Malone Institute, that's a, a real extension organisation. Um, so they're sort of proof of concept sites that they're setting up around the country do lead to further adoption. So it's, yeah. um, it's definitely a way to go, these demonstration sites. 
All right, next question. Um, Phil, we're sort of, we're over time. Are you happy to keep going for another 20 minutes? Yeah. Um, do we have any audience, Richard? Because you and I can end up talking to each other without an audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we still have 50 people left, Phil. All right. How does biochar help with the small water cycle? Well, I discussed, I discussed that earlier, as you'd seen, is that um, biochar is as in any charged compound in, in a low charge environment, and most of our arid lands are on low charge, um, is a quite useful um, supplements for building up um, organic matter in the soil. There's lots of other supplements, of course. You can use zeolites. You can also do a system of cyclic, um, and when it's cyclic, it's gotta be somewhere between five and 10 years, um, uh, burning um, to, of local of grasses to uh, reintroduce the char by and effectively what you're doing is is low temperature burn late in the evening and you're building a localized char in the soil that then gets um, charged by the fungi. So there's no doubt that it is of benefit, but it's it's one one of many tools you can use. All right, next question. How many small water cycles to make a large water cycle in Australian rangelands? I'm not sure if there's an answer to that. Um, for, firstly, to, you've got to work it in hand with a large water cycle. So it's not do small water cycles, make a large water cycle. For large water cycle, the cyclones and so on push, push the water into the Australian rangelands. To keep it cycling, you do need, so if you dump the first lot of rain from the cyclone, then the, the thunderstorms that follow in the coming months are all locally generated. So if you're holding more water on land, you'll get more follow-ons from that large water event. So it's not, it's not the other way around in Australia. Um, we've got to pull in more water um, from the ocean by having a, a, some sort of connected biotic pump. And then the more vegetation you've got on land, the more e evapotranspiration potential you've got, the more roughage surface you've got, the more you keep perpetuating that small water cycle from the water provided by the large water cycle. Well, I got a question. So some people say- Not the less, Richard. The only way to restore the small water cycle is to plant lots of trees. They so suck that suck that water back out. Um, do you think that small water cycles can be maintained with pastures, or is there a need? very much so, Richard? Um, much of our land in Australia has swelling soils, and so you've got gill guys, you've got treeless plains, and um, the pastures on those still get thunderstorms over them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. And many of the trees in Australia are, um, are suited for arid conditions. So they don't tend to put out much of evapotranspiration, whereas the, the pastures that respond or the grasses that respond to the cyclone uh, input rain um, do provide a lot more evapotranspiration for local thunderstorms. So trees alone are not the solution. They are the solution in certain landscapes, but for a lot of Australia, then they're, they're not the sole solution. Question number six. I am interested in rainwater harvesting, water efficient, energy efficient irrigation, and groundwater recharge. It's not really a question. Um, okay, well, the talk's been about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> And Richard, you, uh, your inputs of, of measuring it have also been about that. So uh, once it. again, rainwater harvesting, water efficiency, energy efficient irrigation is a little bit different. We didn't cover that. And groundwater recharge, we covered all those with the understanding that it's, you, we're working towards in agricultural systems that are regenerative. It's 100% cover 100% of the time. We're working to diverse systems that include both perennial, and annuals um, and C3 and C4 um, species in your rotation. C3 is a, and C4 are a type of chemical process for chlor the chlorophyll uses to convert sunlight. 
C4 tend to be tropical plants um, that are uh, very water efficient and hopelessly energy efficient, and C3 are energy efficient and not water efficient. So they don't, the C3s don't have lots of, of leafy matter um, or dead tillers. If you look at ryegrass and clover, they don't have, you know, stalks and things. Whereas if you look at, um, say, kangaroo grass or sugarcane, it has, it has lots of stalks. And in lo and lots of dead matter. So yeah, I, that's really what the talk has been about. Groundwater recharge is using organic matter, the perennials, um, the the tap roots to actually ensure you get great infiltration. Um, so yeah. All right. So question seven's related to that. I would like to discuss about linking groundwater related. I think it's meant to be topics, not tropics, to this subject area. I'd say that that's a big part of what the Maloon Institute's investigating, those um, the interactions between the shallow groundwater systems and how they can be recharged from adjacent streams, um, particularly out into those alluvial floodplains. I don't know if you want to add to that, Phil. Look, both, both you and I have masters in groundwater, um, so it's an area that's dear to our, our heart is groundwater recharge. Um, and you can, there's lots of ways we can enhance it, but effectively using nature is the most efficient way to approach it. So what you're doing at the Maloon Institute is, you know, not dissimilar to the type of systems that we're, we are encouraging farmers to get involved in. Um, so groundwater recharge is very, very important for Australia. We don't want to be over harvesting groundwater and all the state governments have departments that carefully look at that though there are a number of aquifers that are in non-sustainable mode um, and the moment that's in the process of, of endeavour to be corrected. So recharge is essential for us. Um, number eight, I'm working on local town planning reform, uh, Western Australian Council, vegetative cover key. And then it's got SWC is MIA in consideration. So I think MIA, I suspect, is missing in action. <laughs> oh, Maybe not. Um, look, um, veg vegetative cover is key. We don't disagree. Um, but vegetative cover in, in a productive landscape system and in, in, in a town. So at the moment, um, developers are, because um, the cost of building, just removing old trees. Um, uh, and then you, they replant afterwards. So even in the um, the urban environment, having um, um, areas of, of dense tree cover is essential for a whole variety of things, for birds, for, for fungi, um, but also for the temperature associated in those urban environments. So urban heat effect is a whole other discussion. And I think we need, for the sake of uh, Beverly, to leave that one alone at the moment, Richard. All right. Um, next question, number nine. Is there easy links or graphs to information which can be shared with farmers to explain why or how it works? Well, I suppose, firstly, there's these webinars which are saved and accessible through our website. So any of the graphs and things that are included in Phil's um, webinar today can be sourced there. Phil, did you want to add to that? Yeah, look, um, part of the reason that, that I wrote the book two years ago was to provide some of the science behind it. Um, it is written for people with about a year 10 science level, so there are quite a bit of science concepts discussed in it. Um, it doesn't include that latest lot of gra graphics we put up, Richard, just then on the um, erosion and alluvium flooding, but it um, it does pre present a lot more than what I've um, presented in today's talk. Um, in terms of other information, your various state departments of agriculture and groundwater uh, have information bulletins as well for the local state and local areas. Um, but at this point in time, which is why I'm potentially thinking about my second book, there isn't actually something written simplistically on the whole concept from a science perspective on, on 
you know, what it is that works on regenerative agriculture. Um, there's been quite a bit done on the journey of people. So if you go to Charles Massey's book on um, the, the reed warbler, um, you will find there a, a description. You've also got Soils for Life that all also produce um, some background information as well. So it, it is around, and I suspect the Maloon Institute will have um, graphics available too. Um, but certainly there, there's not a simple uh, textbook that, that sets out these principles. They're, they're, they're quite new in development. As I said, the biotic pump was not known to 2007. The IPCC didn't even consider vegetation until 2014. So these concepts are, though the, the, basic, the, the fundamental theory is well known, their application is quite new. All right. Question number 10, tools for measuring local vapotranspiration. Oh, Richard, I was going to throw that one to you, but there are quite a few, but I think you're better, um, best to answer that. Um, uh, the, to measure transpiration is actually quite difficult. There's lots of sap meters and things that you can use. So um, there's a company in Australia that makes those called ICT out of Armadale that will um, be able to give you via modeling from sap flow meters the transpiration rate. There are um, a series of work done by University of Queensland on quite expensive things called, and the name just escapes me at the moment, um, climate towers. Maybe? No, climate towers. Is it climate towers? Where they put them in, in the fields and they have a whole series of different measure, um, measurements occurring. That's um, so sort can, of eddy covariance towers sort of thing. Yeah. So you can get those, those towers there, but they're about 100 grand each. They're, they're not little cheap things. Um, and then I'm going to can... cut in here, Phil. We're running out of time, but I can tell you, you can measure it with dendrometers or sap flow sensors, or you can estimate it based on local climate stations and various standard algorithms that convert. Um, you can also get various um, estimates from sites like what used to be called CropWatt for different types of crop that you can combine in with your local weather station data. Um, so we, we're using all, typically we're using sap flow and dendrometers for direct measurements, you know, so particularly on trees, but also on some pastures with the dendrometers. Um, so plenty of different ways to do it. Um, also, the Bureau provides you just with forecasts of ET as well. Um, sorry, Phil, but we're running a bit short for time. Uh, oh, question no 11. Problem. Who are the top three leading soil CDR MRV solutions today and why? And who would you name as the top three most progressive nations? Well, there you go. That's one for you. Yeah, look, it's carbon dioxide removal. Um, measurement verification. I've forgotten what the R stands for, but um, so what you're talking about, so they're talking about soil carbon sequestration here. Um, what's the the top three leading solutions? Well, they vary from um, whether you're pastoral, uh, tropical, pastoral temperate, um, or, or wet uh, southern wet pastoral to cropping. So it varies considerably. Um, New South, sorry, the Australian federal government's listed 13 practices. Many of those 13 don't work alone. So you've got to actually do a number together. Um, so I wouldn't hazard a guess for a particular area to say what are the three leading ones. But at the moment with the registrations that occur, the leading ones on mass, not necessarily um, for any particular area, is multi-species multi pasture. Uh, change in fertilizer regime and mob grazing are uh, the main ones that have, are being utilized in, in the registrations for uh, carbon, soil carbon projects. Um, the top three progressive nations by far is Australia, is well out in front. Um, in terms of the rest of the world, uh, the US and Europe are 
heavily involved in, in modeling and not so much measurement, though Europe may well go down that pathway. Um, so it's, and, and the uh, soil carbon uh, removal programs on farms are very nascent, even more so than Australia, and Australia still itself is quite nascent. In terms of um, river alluvium flooding, the UK is probably further ahead than Australia and has a national scheme for that. Um, for the last five or six years. Um, but in terms of carbon, um, they're uh, somewhat behind us. Um, and I'm not quite too sure of, of alluvium flooding in, in most other countries. Um, the US is, is behind in, in both uh, in terms of national approaches, um, though they're obviously leading proponents in regen agriculture out of the US. but. Um, going to having impacts. So uh, I suppose that's my answer for that one, Richard. Okay. Um, very important question number 12, last of the early bird questions. Will regenerative farming techniques ever make it to be the accepted practice? Why and why not? Um, they will. Um, the term regenerative is something a lot of farmers don't like currently because there's two types of farmers that have undertaken regenerative practice so far in the majority, not sorry, all of them, but in the majority. Um, the first is those that have gone through some sort of perturbation in their life. They've had the farm um, completely burnt, as the case in, in Colin um, Sykes out of um, Dogong, or they've had a number of disasters as like Charles Massey. So they've been forced down that pathway as an only solution. Um, and they've been some of the innovators. Um, to some extent, Gabe Brown would fall into that category out of the US as well. Then you've got the people who have significant off-farm income and are able to, to play and learn. So um, you've got uh, Patricia, I've forgotten her surname. Um, he's married to, to Philip Adams, who has a very successful um, garlic farm um, and so can afford the opportunity of not being dependent wholly on the income from the farm. And then you've got um, um, Brian Brown, the actor, and his wife, the actor and producer, whose name escapes me at the moment, who are just about to release a movie movie in a couple of weeks um, on sustainable agriculture. So they tend to be the two types that have got involved and started it and been innovative in it. There are some exceptions. Um, uh, the Hegarty's over in West Australia are an exception who run a very, very, very successful wheat farm on regenerative principles who weren't one of those two categories. So they're the people who've started it. The problem we've got in Australia, as I've talked about before, is we don't have enough advisors. Um, and the, traditionally, the farmers, the traditional farmers see regenerative farmers as people who've got off farm income and can destock or do things, and they're not real farmers. So that's been a kind of hang back on it. Um, the other thing is people don't understand agri uptake of agricultural technologies, that you're looking at from innovator through um, um, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and lag ads, that's about a 40-year process. And with re Regen Ag, we're barely into the first 10 years, possibly less. Um, so if you look at no-till, no-till in Australia was first experimented with in 1963 or so. Um, wasn't out of the innovation phase until the late 70s. So you're looking at about a 15-year um, cycle on innovation, and innovation's somewhere between 1% and 2% of farmers. So I, I think we're asking a lot of re regen ag to have widespread adoption, given what the limitations of how farmers uptake technologies, which is to wait till someone's in the district, to wait till it's fully studied by the, the state departments and fully dis decimated um, to the industry. It takes quite a bit of time. Um, so I'm not despondent at all that the uptake appears to be slow because 
it is slow compared to um, no-till, but not hugely slow. And no-till had very substantive financial benefits. Um, and it, it, it took to have the majority of farmers, say 90% involved in no-till that cropped, didn't actually occur till literally 2010 from a 1963 start. So on that basis, um, I'm comfortable regenerative practice will be uptaken because it's financially better to do so and it's more sustainable for the farm and farmers are seeing that they've lost fa fairy rings and mushrooms and they've lost the small birds. So they, they know that they're causing impact on the landscape and they're not horribly keen about it. But how do you make the change? How do you become green and stay in the black is what, the, what this is about. Um, so yeah, I'm not despondent at all that there doesn't appear to be a fast uptake. I think that the uptake we're getting is about on par with, with normal agricultural uptake. It's, um, it's interesting to see the demand that the Malone Institute's getting through their consultancy for taking on some of these land use practices, like demand is actually increasing substantially, like there's a lot of demand. So that's one of the advisory groups you can reach out to uh, if you're on the call and you're looking for some advice, that's why they exist. All right, Phil, I think we've got 11 questions left in the Q&A. What we might have to do is just commit to the audience that we're going to send out some emails to answer your further questions there. Um, how, many are, how many are still online, Richard? 30 people. Well, it's now two o'clock. Do you want to have a quick go at a, at a few of them? And if we lose 30 <laughs> people, then we'll, we'll right. respond. Here we go. Jeanette Conti. Conti, I hope that's how you pronounce it. Is there any evidence of the degree of revegetation that would be needed in agricultural areas to restore the small water cycle? I'm in Western Australia. Okay. Um, the West Australian Department of Ag is very keen um, to adopt in programs looking to restore the, the small water cycle on a regional basis. And there are, they have started um, to investigate which programs and which farms and which areas to do it on. So I know there's, there's starting to be a lot of work done there. Um, the short answer to the question is no, Richard. Um, th there is not a lot of knowledge about how much is needed across a region. Even Maloon Institute is still looking at or is a small river catchment to understand how many farmers do you have to get engaged? Is, is it all of it? Is it 5%? Is it 20% to have an impact? We don't know yet. It would be a good thing to work out, wouldn't it? Yeah. That's a really important number. That's one thing to take home is that the actual actions on the ground are all very doable. The sort of direction on where to do and how much to do is where places like the Malone Institute have a real important role to play. Uh, but also I would have thought other advisory bodies, just UK oh. management authorities, etc. Well, Landcare itself has, has, a, has a big role as well going forward, I think. And New South Wales Landcare are looking into this at the moment. So watch this space, I guess. Next question, is it possible to restore the degradation? Um, coincident with the Aboriginals arriving in Australia was, was the extinction of um, the megafauna, a lot of it, except for the megafauna that was useful, such as kangaroos. Um, but the megafauna disappeared and then a new equilibrium was established um, and a cultural system called the Dreamtime built around that to protect that equilibrium. Um, we can't fully recover back to the base that we were at and we will, within our system, create and as a community accept what a new plateau or equilibrium will be. So I'm hopeful that as Australian community that um, 
we won't continue on this pathway of of potential wide spread landscape destruction desertification and we will create practices in LAW as opposed to LORE um, that results in um, community uh, adoption of principles that protect the land. All right, next question. This is uh, anonymous attendee. You mentioned earlier that people aren't looking at the small water cycle. Why is that? Very good question. Um, look, Richard, when you and I did hydrogeology, we, we were taught only a little bit about the small water cycle, and that's in a master's degree. Um, so the the concept of the small water cycle was only starting to get in scientific literature associated with um, uh, hydrogeology and water professional managers from about the early to, to mid 2000s, you know, to 2010. Um, so to get it out into the general public um, is going to take a, a bit more. And there's a number of people in Australia beyond myself and yourself, Richard, who um, are communicating the, this importance as there are around the world. But it is um, something that has been known about, but it's it's huge importance, largely not realised. I also say it's it's a difficult thing to measure. So often, uh, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So it hasn't been front and centre versus say what the Bureau of Meteorology can provide us in the broader sort of rainfall patterns and that sort of thing. So there might be an element of that there too. Well. Nick, I think part of the realisation also is that um, as computer scale has improved, the capacity to model some of these systems has improved. And it's only once modelling systems analysis and flux rates, uh, flux modelling got very popular, that they actually started to realise um, the small water cycle and the biotic pump, that the two connected together, are actually a huge influence. And that's only really very, very recent. Okay, uh, James Stewart's got an interesting question. Great content, thank you. Could holes drilled through surface and filled with biochar help water table infiltration faster than trees? Um, yes, um, we have put something in very similar at um, Nelson Bay. Um, to that, which is injecting stormwater to groundwater. So you're dealing with, um, and we've we proposed something in Kuwait quite similar, um, but also using trees to manage the small water cycle uh, in Kuwait and restore the climate back 2000 years ago. But yes, um, in injection schemes are very beneficial. Two of the largest injection schemes of stormwater in the world um, one was designed by CSI Owens installed in Adelaide, and one was designed um, by a team headed by myself and installed in Nelson Bay. Um, at the moment, most of it's it's passive, uh, and these two systems are passive as well. Um, but they're direct injection using um, uh, polishing mechanisms. We didn't use biochar. We used a variety of 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 polishing systems at the front end, but we could have easily used biochar. Um, and uh, um, CSIRA used a wetland at the front end then with a, a gallery um, recharge system. So those are available for large space systems um, associated with cities where you can afford the, the infrastructure needed. Um, rural ones will still highly depend on um, recharge through wetlands or through um, weirs and river-based flooding of alluvium. All right. Next question. Marcus Buchanan. Is the bigger system constraints humans? The growers I work with resist these concepts. Um, that's because we're at the point of... Um, early adopters so or innovators we haven't got to early adopters so 
the bottom line is, yes, it's human behaviour. And that's why I went back to the adoption of technology by agriculture at its normal rate. Um, it's also what I call a valley of death, is to cross that the farmers got to be comfortable um, that they have the reserves um, for the loss of income that may occur during the change that, that happens. Um, and they can afford the infrastructure to make the change. So, so that there is resistance. We could get and should get from the government um, some tax relief or funding help that, that encourages the change to happen because it's for the benefit of all of Australia, not just the farmer. Um, so yes, and then there's human nature. It's, um, it's like two young kids going to the toilet and pissing up the wall to see who can piss up the highest. The girls don't do this, of course, but us boys are animals when it comes to behaviour. Um, so, this analogy, that's yep. uh, magnificent. So yeah, you like to have the silo. Um, the farmer who drops the wheat off at the silo likes to say, you know, I've got 10 tonnes for the hectare um, and have the highest, highest yield of the district um, rather than the farmer who makes the most profit. So no farmer brags about making the most profit in the district, but they all brag at what is the most yield. So to move from an agricultural yield to a financial yield makes a lot of sense. So there is a lot of resistance and this will take longer than a minute, but the leading cane farmer in the world who's, who, who that was a photo of his paddock we used, his brother and he were the first to stop um, um, burning and to do green harvesting. And he did many other things as well. And the neighbours were just a bit disgruntled, disgruntled and used to say he produced more PhDs than cane off his property. Um, but he did um, produce a lot of money and still makes a lot of money and made a lot of money this year from having, in the last two years, from um, organic farming, or, sorry, organic carbon farming, because he sequestered so much carbon, his soils were able to get the flood water infiltrated quicker than his neighbours and he got yield off. His, father, his brother, when I went up there and I saw his brother was burning again, and I said, this was a decade ago, and I said, why is your brother burning? And he said his wife couldn't cop the criticism at the shop. So to be different in a farm community is quite difficult. If you're the innovator, you cop a lot of flag. And at this stage, we've not moved past the innovators. There's not enough innovator. There's no... Lots of districts with no innovators in them yet on regen. So yes, it is very difficult at the moment if you're an innovator. And so you've got to be exceptionally thick skinned to survive. All right, thanks, Phil. Unfortunately, I have to go. I'm uh, 10 minutes late for another meeting. There's three questions left. So we'll have to uh, send out an email to those but many thanks everybody for coming and many thanks to you phil too for another fantastic presentation um thanks richard thanks very much for coming everybody appreciate it thanks richard it's a pleasure cheers phil bye